What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Data Dash, and today is July 15th of 2022. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are because in today's video, we're gonna talk about why a coming summer relief rally is likely in the cards for both Bitcoin, altcoins, and even the broader equity markets as a whole. Now, I wanna make it very clear, while we're not calling for the absolute bottom being, and we do believe that an extended bear market could still play out, we do believe in the reality that there is likely going to be a relief rally in the market like there has been in the past. And it simply has to do with the fact that now that a lot of sellers have been forced out of the market, we now likely have more buyers than sellers at these prices. So we've got a lot of things to dive into in today's video. You guys won't want to miss it as well as a sponsored review of Fluid Finance. Really exciting platform in the fintech and crypto space. So stay tuned. You guys won't want to miss it. All right, let's go ahead and kick this conversation off. Now, you all know there have been a few key things that we've been looking for in order to determine whether or not the bulls are back in charge versus the bears. That is a very important point here. We simply wanna know if the buyers are outweighing sellers in the market and that those who are looking forward to higher prices versus lower prices is in a higher camp of activity. We wanna see that there are more buyers in the market. Now, let's go ahead and first talk a little bit about what happened since we last spoke on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we spoke about the CPI number release, which was gonna be a major volatile event for financial markets, and boy was it. It was a pretty exciting day. The NASDAQ immediately dropped over 3% following the release of the CPI numbers. And we also saw Bitcoin and Ethereum make massive moves to the downside initially because the CPI number surprised a lot of people. We got over 9.1% inflation year over year for the month of June, following again uh, in the higher direction than many people expected due to high commodity prices. This was a big upset. But interestingly enough, while all the while we had that major decline in asset prices that dragged Ethereum and Bitcoin and stocks down, what's incredible about it is that as we came down to the lower bound range here and actually deviated below the support range that we've been holding, we got right back into the channel here and we started to trend higher. Price held up back where it was at before the announcement and is now trended back up to $20,800. And this is a big reason why we talked about not trying to short after this announcement, not trying to be too eager to try to bet that, oh, you know, if the CPI number is worse than expected, that we're gonna see a crater in price. We didn't see that. And crazy enough is that even though we had what many people probably saw was the worst case scenario for the CPI, price is now chartering higher here. And Bitcoin has a real opportunity to give the bulls serious advantage to continue carrying the trend higher. We are now chartering right against, and you can just see how important and significant this metric is here. The four hour time frame, we're taking a look at the 200 moving average and how price is coiling up against it. And if we can get an hour, or excuse me, a candle or two of price action above this, it's likely that we're gonna come all the way up here to the, the uh, 200 EMA, which is sitting around $21,900. Now that will probably decline slightly, but we're gonna get an opportunity to come up, retest that range, and turn these two metrics into new support. That is what we wanna see here. We wanna get above those ranges, be able to turn them into support, showing that the bulls are not letting up on the momentum they recently gained and that they want more. It's simply letting price tell us what we need to hear. We aren't thinking with our buys, we're not getting too eager, we're waiting for the right setup. Because if we can get price above these moving averages and turn them into support, right? After that, we've potentially got a major move to the upside here, something in the upper $20,000 range going from 25,000 to 30,000. I don't wanna call it too confidently, but we could get a serious move here. And the reason why is because like back here in May, of 2022, we had a month-long consolidation. 
very similar here. We've been in over a month of consolidation here in price. And you've got a lot of longs and a lot of shorts in either of these channels. And if price starts to go substantially in the other direction, especially getting above this channel, you've got a whole lot of shorts, not just from this channel, and also this channel who could very well be taking significant losses or for the people in this channel be underwater and potentially get liquidated causing a massive short squeeze to the upside that's what we need to look out for and why we need to understand that derivatives can drive markets in dramatic directions to the downside and also to the upside i would say take this decline here as an example if you think it can't happen to the upside Think again, it can very well happen here. There are much more shorts in this market than longs. There aren't many players here willing to take the risk at down in this range. And a lot of people, again, while we do have those price targets of $14,000, $15,000 still being in the cards in the long run, it's not gonna happen overnight. And there are gonna be relief rallies that knock people out who think it's just gonna happen tomorrow, right? The price is gonna go down to 14K tomorrow, I know it. When in reality, there are these relief rallies that knock you out, they knock your socks off, you lose everything, and that's exactly how the market trades against you. You gotta know where the market is gonna chase those liquidations. The exchanges have every incentive to do it, unfortunately. Now, I wanna go ahead and talk about Ethereum here. Ethereum is the proof in the pudding here that we've got a really good chance here of a breakout. We had all the bearish steps here as we talked about in the previous video, the descending triangle here, an ascending triangle which is bullish but it failed here as we broke down below. Interestingly enough though, whereas many people expected this to just collapse lower in price, buyers came in, we had an engulfing candle pushing us back here into the ascending triangle. And if you get a breakout, a daily close above 1290 to 1300, you're likely gonna go all the way up here to 1700 and retest that previous support range and see if it's gonna act as resistance or if price can break through. And I think that this offers a really solid opportunity, not just for Bitcoin and Ethereum to move higher, but also for the altcoin market. Again, as we've talked about, taking upon this strength here that we're gonna see here in the short term over the next month, month and a half, where we can start to lower our positions in the market. We don't have to cut as bad of losses as we would have before. And that's the reason why we emphasize this point of not getting caught two steps behind. Again, I don't wanna say it's guaranteed yet, but it is looking very likely that we're gonna have this. And I'm gonna talk about the signs we wanna see here. We already discussed one point here which is getting above the 200 EMA and the 200 moving average for the four hour time frame, making that support and starting to cup up to the previous relative highs above that range. The second thing here as well, I wanna see the ETH to BTC ratio hold within this channel yet again. Just like how its dollar pair broke below the ascending triangle it was building up, if we can hold within here, and we can also hold within the ascending channel on the ETH to BTC pair over the four hour 200 EMA. That is gonna give me all the signs I need to know that Ethereum is likely going to come back up towards the upper band of the channel. A near 13.5% move sometime in late July, or maybe we even break slightly above that. Again, this is gonna be where I'm gonna keep my target range here. It could happen faster than we expect. We can see this breakout has happened quite quickly. So maybe we just get something going into late July, maybe not into August. Either way, this would be my target range, somewhere around a 12 to 13.5% move here, coming back to the upper band of the channel. And this honestly makes sense here if we're taking a look at some of the data science models in the market. One of my favorites is a variation of the Nupool model on net unrealized profit and loss. This is just a model through our partner CryptoQuant, which you guys can definitely check out at the link down below in the description. It's set up an account. They have a lot of great free data resources and for some of the different packages they have, they have some really awesome things like community charts that you can access through the ProChart feature and all kinds of other different research points. But the major thing I wanted to share here today in the video is the net unrealized loss. And we are at the very standard typical correction range here of around 0.5 here on the ratio. Just like we were back here in the May, uh, excuse me, the March 2020 correction, the previous bear market, and also during previous bear markets in 2015. 
Now, of course, over time, it gets less exacerbated usually. And this looks to be about the range here where we would likely get some support or some relief in the market before potentially continuing lower. But it's not just what's going on in the crypto market. We need to go macro here and understand that there are a few key dynamics that are setting up success for risk on assets. Take a look here at the NASDAQ 100. It's the futures for the NASDAQ. Again, here's your drop from the uh, CPI here. And we can see that right after we had practically an engulfing candle making up all those losses on the next four hour candle. And while we retreated down here, buyers came in quickly, right? These candles right here are significant signs that there is not many sellers in the market. And when they do print price lower, buyers come in with significant volume. You can see just how much bigger the volume candle is. Even though it's a red candle here, we can see that the bulls really drove up the price here, right? And then afterwards squeezed it higher, another big volume candle. And now it's a matter of trying to get back above those 200 EMA and 200 MA targets on the four hour time frame. Again, both times we tried to do that here in the month of June, we failed to hold it. So for about a month now, we're finally getting a third opportunity. Maybe the third time is the charm here where we can get above there. And that is what we're gonna be looking for. Now, here are the big things that I wanna go and focus on. This is a chart that we put out in the Dash Report. This is the kind of stuff you guys can get if you subscribe to the Dash Report. We have a link down below in the description. It's essentially where I go through and I break down in my newsletter on uh, the equity markets, crypto markets, Forex markets, and commodities, give a whole macro perspective of what's going on. And we've been talking for really the past two years in our Forex section about how the dollar is going to likely continue garnering strength. We've barely deviated away from that. We've been bullish and long the dollar. No, it's not just because I'm from the US, but because of the fact here that the dollar has been showcasing significant strength all the way back since 2008. If you look at this long-term time frame, right now we're looking at the Dixie. This is the dollar index on a quarterly time frame. And we presented this chart in our newsletter, I think for the past two or three months, that we were gonna see a significant rally in the dollar here going into 2023. And we can see that we're getting towards these overbought levels here for, this, um, for the RSI essentially. Now, when we get up to this 70% range, we tend to find a major decline in the Dixie, even if it continues afterwards. And we do believe that it's gonna have more upside to go. But we think that over the next uh, quarter, essentially, maybe even at the end of this month, we might be in for some kind of decline here as we're getting towards overbought territory before we continue higher. And if the dollar starts to lose strength, that is gonna provide relief to a lot of risk on assets. It's gonna show here that people are not as in demand for dollars as they were previously, or that a lot of the demand that was coming in was short term, and that we can see a decline and more demand back in to risk on assets. Let's go ahead and take a look at another element here. Crude oil. Crude oil is barely holding by a thread here. After failing a near six month long wedge that it was building up since the start of the year, back here in February, we have now cratered below it, used that previous line of support on the wedge as resistance, turned over, and are just barely holding on to that 200 EMA on the daily chart. If that breaks down, that's gonna be your sign for a relief rally in the market. Because after a breakdown there, if we simply take a look at the weekly here, there just really isn't any major ranges of potential support until around 8440. And if that isn't able to be held, and I think it's more likely rather than not, that we're gonna come down to this EMA here, the 200 week EMA, all right? Now this, again, has proven to be an important range of support back in the past. And we've got a long way to go until we get down there. It would make sense with a double top failed wedge here for the bulls giving the bears back control on crude oil, which is again going to lower the CPI in the preceding months, the rolling cost year over year for oil on average, as well as natural gas. And that is gonna give the Fed the room to not have to hike rates as much if that continues up. This is the biggest thing you can keep your eye on here. If we continue to see this roll over here, we've got some significant downside, and that means we could even start to print negative prices 
uh, excuse me, uh, negative year-over-year -year changes in the preceding months in the CPI if we get this kind of decline in oil. Again, I don't know if it's going to be lasting or long term, but that's just an important thing to note here. If oil does have these significant declines, the costs can start to go down. Wages can start to capture um, against some of that trend difference between the increase in the cost of goods and the amount people are paying, excuse me, are getting paid for their jobs. And one thing I want to go ahead and say here, I know a lot of people have differing opinions on what oil is going to do because it does have a lot to do with the whole war between Russia and Ukraine. And I'm not one to debate about it or talk about uh, where it's heading or how things are going. I simply just like to look at price. And if we look at price here, the two major oil giants, there's a couple others that we could take a look at, but Gazprom as well as Rosneft, as you can see from the chart here, if we're taking a look at the weekly time frames, any relief we saw here is being sold off. We are now down below the 200 week EMA and 200 week moving average here. I think we're about to enter in to at least a short term period where the world sees a glimmer of hope here that things could start to get better, that we can start to mitigate some of the supply chain issues, that commodity imports and exports are going to flourish that they're going to get better and they're going to drive prices down and essentially bring us back to a point where people at least feel some temporary relief. Not to say that all the problems in the world are going to be solved or going to be fixed permanently, but at least we could see some upside here in the short term. I'm curious to hear what you guys think about this discussion point, but if you enjoyed it, definitely drop a like and let's go ahead and kick off the conversation around fluid finance. Alrighty, everyone. So in today's sponsor review, we're going to be diving into a new cryptocurrency and fintech application that I've been keeping my eye on over the past month and a half that I think offers a lot of opportunity and innovation for the cryptocurrency space. Today, we're going to be diving in to none other than Fluid Finance. Now, for those of you who are hearing about Fluid for the first time, I want to go ahead and quickly run down the two major things that they're aiming to do. Not only are they aiming to serve as a replacement for your traditional bank, offering all the expected services like deposits and withdrawals, money transfers, spending your money in the real world with a debit card or retail locations, and the ability to earn some yield on your savings. But on top of that as well, they aim to be your bridge into the world of Web3, essentially allowing you to digitize euros, dollars, Great British pounds into a tokenized format, use them in external wallets like MetaMask, and enter into the world of DeFi and NFTs all without the need to use a dozen different platforms or exchange services. This is pretty big, and I wanna spend some time to talk about how they radically focus on providing transparency at every step of the process, from yield generation, as well as the minting of new tokens and their stable coins. So we've got a lot to uncover here within the video. Let's go ahead and dive into it. So I wanna start by just diving straight in to the platform here. Now the first thing you're gonna notice here when you dive into Fluid Finance and set up an account is that the user experience is incredibly clean. It is simple. I can't tell you guys how many times I've used different crypto apps that aim, or at least they say they're aimed towards helping newcomers into the industry and making the process simple, but they have 80% of the services featured on there that I really don't need. What most people want at the end of the day is they want to have a core place to manage their assets and access some basic features like getting yield or being able to bridge off into the world of DeFi if they want those additional services. And that's exactly what Fluid does. Across their web-based application, Android and iOS, they have a very clean vertical user experience here that's very familiar to mobile users. And all your major tabs here, your wallet tab where it shows a good overview of your funds and any recent transfer history as well as interest payments, but outside of that as well, some key action items here, and your savings tab. And that leads me to the first topic of conversation here talking about savings on Fluid. Now, I understand here, guys, that a lot of people are gonna jump the gun here with some concern. And I think that that's completely fair. We're in a pretty rough time in the crypto space right now when it comes to the term yield generation or getting interest on your funds. And that skepticism is healthy, but it's important to understand here that Fluid Finance, rather than being like a BlockFi, Nexo, or Celsius, is much more like a traditional bank that is utilizing fee generation as a way to pay out funds to its users. So unlike Celsius, BlockFi, or Nexo, which depend on people depositing their crypto and then lending it out to borrowers, instead, 
Fluid focuses on charging a spread between conversion of traditional fiat currency into many of their stable coins like DUSD, DGBP, and DEURO, and vice versa when people are going back into their traditional banking services and converting their tokenized version of fiat currency into real dollars in the account. That's the important thing to understand here, that the yield is generated from those fees. And instead of like a traditional bank, which usually just keeps it for themselves and charges pretty absorbent fees, trust me, living abroad, coming from the US, I know that personally and firsthand, they are actually passing it back on to the users. And I think that that's pretty cool. The fact that you can get three to 4% here on an annualized basis is really nice. And as you can see, interest is paid out daily here. So the 400 that I have deposited in here, I'm getting about four cents every single day. So it's really exciting to see here. And I think it's nice because it offers you the ability to fiat on ramp a whole range of different fiat currencies. And the big thing that I think is on the everyone's mind here is are the funds insured and how are the stable coins minted? And these are two topics that I wanna spend some time to talk about. First off, the big topic of insurance here. The funds here that are deposited within the fluid finance application are covered under Lloyd's of London. This is one of the biggest insurance firms based out of the United Kingdom that usually plays, makes insurance products for a whole range of different financial companies, etc. And this is one of the hugest moves I've ever seen when it comes to insurance in the crypto space. It tells me that between the banking services they offer and the crypto tokenization services they offer through Fluid, this is one of the biggest when it comes to the industry standard, essentially following best practices of transparency on reserves and not getting into the risky world of lending and borrowing. With traditional services like Blockfire and Nexo, you just didn't get this kind of insurance coverage. So it shows that a traditional company like Lloyd's is willing to help provide this kind of coverage for an app like Fluid. Now, second off as well, we need to understand how DUSD and all of the other decentralized fiat currencies that Fluid Finance focuses on and offers throughout the platform, how they actually function. So DUSD is really simple. For every single dollar, or Euro or Great British Pound that is minted within the platform through its smart contract, there is a 100% backing, dollar in, dollar out. Essentially, there is no paper, um, paper notes essentially or corporate bonds or other types of things that might have backed currencies like Tether for the past few years, leaving us whether or not the peg would hold at that dollar value. There is a one-to-one -one backing and on top of that, it's important to note that for this one-to-one -one backing, the reason they can't mint more DUSD is that there can never be more DUSD than the verified off-chain asset balance, which pulls from the actual records of their treasury where actual dollars and euros and Great British Pounds are held. And that's a pretty cool system. I like the idea of limiting it, utilizing oracles to protect users essentially and make sure that we have a transparency that's consistently on-chain verifiable about how much funds there truly are. I would love to see on Fluid, and I think this is something that's coming sooner rather than later, the ability on the web page to access that data piece and essentially be able to visualize it on the website. But again, it's an additional plus here. This model overall could really change the game here when it comes to blockchain because as the CEO here talks about, and there's a really good segment here that he did on uh, Real Vision, which is the platform founded by Rob Paul. Robert, and who in this case is the CEO of Fluid, talks a lot and he decide, uh, describes extensively about the fact that you know blockchain is essentially about bringing transparency to finance. There was already a lot of ill transparency and outdated banking models for lending and borrowing in the traditional financial sector. We don't need to bring that into crypto. Instead, we should build a new standard here that doesn't rely on trust, but in this case, depends on people verifying things ahead of time and having access to that information. So I think that that's really exciting here. And I think if you guys have the time, you can dive into about the 14 minute segment here where he talks a little bit more about this system of utilizing the actual treasury amount and making sure that there's always a one-to-one -one backing. If you guys are interested to dive deeper again and still remain skeptical, that's completely fine. You can dive into their GitLab here and actually dive into the code about how DUSD and its other stablecoin counterparts 
operate, as well as the audit report from Solidified, a smart contract auditing firm that worked with Polymath, as well as a whole range of other DeFi applications like Loopring and OpenSea. So there's a lot of exciting standards here that Fluid has followed here. They've been building behind the scenes for some time during the good times, and even here during the bad times in the market. And it's really exciting to see that they're coming in at this perfect opportunity when the market is looking for a new guard here, essentially, to actually build a new set of standards for deposits and accessing a whole range of features. Now, when we come back here to Fluid Finance, I wanna go ahead and hit on some of the additional features here. We can not only again top up and send money from our account here, but on top of that, we can access some of the extras. We can set up a bank account here. So for example, if we want to set up a traditional bank to access all those banking services, uh, like depositing traditional fiat currency and doing money transfers, we can do that. But outside of that, we can also set up a fluid card so we can go spend our money in the real economy. And again, this isn't like uh, per se the traditional cryptocurrency debit cards, uh, but rather in this case, they're a debit card that allows you to spend stable coins or fiat currency. So again, one important thing here to understand about fluid is it's not so much focused on depositing assets like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin. It's not to say that that won't come in the future, but they're much more focused on the stable coin and fiat currency element, allowing you to get that yield and utilize it like you would in a traditional bank. So again, much more like a Neo bank or FinTech app versus just a cryptocurrency platform standalone. Now, outside of this, well, we can also connect a wallet here. And I wanna go ahead and dive a little bit in to what that process looks like here, where we can connect a traditional MetaMask wallet and start to bridge our funds into the world of layer two. And from here, we can see now that Fluid Finance is helping us to track our on-chain balance of DUSD and any other stable coins we might convert. But here's the really interesting thing. In the top hand part of the screen, we can see the mint button here. And all the while I don't have any Arbitrum ETH in my wallet to actually mint this, which you will need in order to do conversion, we now have access to minting here now that we have a verified wallet. And there's even a way here where you can start to buy some Arbitrum ETH in order to actually convert those stable coins from the balance on Fluid Finance into your MetaMask wallet that you can have full self custody ownership over. And this is really, really exciting. So you can actually go out and utilize it on Uniswap to trade into various other cryptocurrencies. You can use it to buy NFTs. You can use it on different DeFi protocols. You name it. How about it? It's for you to decide once you step into that world of DeFi and Web3. And as always, you can take your funds back here, convert them, sending them from your MetaMask wallet back into your Fluid Finance account and have them yet again all back in one place. So this is really exciting. I think it's a completely different way to go about managing stable coins and generating them for that matter. And I think that this is gonna change the way we think about how cryptocurrency stable coins should work. Anyone should be able to, like through Fluid, Fluid Finance, essentially be able to digitize dollars. But we should also know as well that any dollars that come in into existence in the world of tokenized stable coins should come from real currencies in the traditional banking sector. So that there's always a one-to-one -one backing that we have trust in and we can understand here and verify for ourselves. But this is kind of the first introduction to Fluid Finance for today's review. I gotta tell you all, I'm really excited to see what the platform does. Again, I wanna see them continue to press on this topic of transparency. I think that that is needed now more than ever in the crypto space. I love to see them leading the way on that. And it would be interesting if longer term, if you're able to start depositing Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other digital assets within the Fluid Finance platform. But they may be focusing more on just a traditional banking approach in this case, while also giving you the gateway to Web3 and your MetaMask in case you want to go out there and actually engage in the crypto world in a truly decentralized way. And that's why I like the approach of Fluid Finance having things more focused on self-custody, and when there are trusted actors, making sure that you can verify all that is important from balances as well as functionality. All right, guys, that's it for today's video. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this one, consider dropping a like. And outside of that as well, look out for more content where we'll be diving into the Fluid Finance platform later in the line. That being said, everyone, thank you all for giving me some time out of your day, and I'll see you all in the next one. Take care, everyone.